Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, on the homeland of, Me of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Totelling, the Administrative Assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation, the first of this new series. And today we're going to learn about Dubai and Oman. Welcome. I want to welcome everybody back. I hope everybody had a good summer, a really nice summer. We're enjoying beautiful fall, but now it's time that I'm going to get a chance to travel with you guys and see some of your great ones. This is one of the trips that I took. Now, my first slide that I'm going to show you is my attempt at a little bit of humor. As a kid, I always remember the start of the RKO, RKO movies. And when I saw this picture, I figured I've got to start this one this way. Dubai and Oman. I had known very little about the Arab world. I'd been to Muslim countries before and every Muslim country is, is completely different. But I was looking when I found out I had the opportunity to go down here and get a chance to see what this was, I, I jumped at the opportunity. And it was a very different world. And as I'd mentioned before, it is a very new city. 1990, this was what Dubai looked like. And it is nothing but an absolute wasteland. By 2008, this was with Dubai and right in an area right in here is where the Burj Khalif, which is now, which is now the tallest building was built. If anybody remembers the old Disney pictures where they had Frontierland and Adventureland, well, they had a thing called Tomorrowland. And as I got into this one, I was astounded. This Dubai is not like anything. It is Tomorrowland. It's just absolutely flabbergasted you. The architecture alone would just blow you away. They have just recently opened this one. It's called the Dynamic Tower. The Dynamic Tower, every floor rotates on its own. So it must be that you've got to own the whole floor because I'm sure that you get to pick. But you could be looking out and seeing the Palm Jumeirah one night and you could see the Burj Khalifa the next morning you wake up. It just is an amazing structure. Many of you have probably heard of this one. This one is called the Hyperloop. It is an incredibly fast machine. It goes 760 miles per hour. It will take you from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, 150 miles in 12 minutes. Elon Musk and Richard Branson got together to hold this one. And you don't feel anything. It just goes amazing. That's faster than the jet was going that got me to Dubai. And you can see why it would have to be covered in because who knows what wildlife, they never have a chance. They didn't have it. Now you can also get yourself, instead of this is one of their taxis. That makes, they've had driverless cars, taxi cars for a long time now, but after seeing some of those, but that's not all, you can even Uber yourself a helicopter. They're not cheap. So this was the type of place at the time I didn't know that I was getting into. Now I, I absolutely love this thing in the back of a plane, my plane. I usually have it on the map all of the time because I like to make see how far we're going. It happened to be Lufthansa that I took. I got on the plane in Regina, 11.50 in the morning. 
We flew to Calgary and then we took an overnight to Frankfurt where I got on to Lufthansa. Then we went from Frankfurt to Dubai. In other words, I left on January the 19th at 11.50 a.m. and I got on January 20th, 10.45 p.m. Lufthansa has pictures out the front. I thought, I heard we we're getting close and I looked out, all I saw was an expanse of blue. That would have simply been the Persian Gulf, which they now call the Arabian Gulf. Then all of a sudden, it's like these things exploded out of the horizon. <laughs> As we got closer, we found this was Dubai. And it just, it just happened to come out of nowhere. So everything seems so flat. The Burj Khalif is in here. But if you notice off in the background, there's nothing. And that is literally what there is outside of Dubai is basically nothing. 10.45, I got a chance to meet and talk with some of the people that were on the tour with us, got a good night's sleep. And then we woke up the next morning and we started our city tour. First thing we went, this was the iconic picture of Dubai before the Burj Khalifa came in. This was the Burj Al Arab. It was the tallest hotel in the world at the time. Now Dubai's got three by itself that are taller. So there are a lot of ones that are taller. They did consider it though, because they did not want to take sun space away from its patrons that they got to lay on the beach. So they made this man-made island out to be able to put put the the El, put the, the, the El Arab up. It is built to resemble a sailing ship. Now that that has been copied several times. Trump himself has co made copied that design and built a hotel in Panama City. In that place, there are nine different entrances. This is one of the main entrances into this. This is the center courtyard. It is the highest courtyard in the world. And it was built to look like these are billowing, all the rooms are to built to look like billowing sails. There are only 202 suites because of the size of the suites. The suites are humongous. This is the Royal Suite. It is thought to be the most expensive of all of the suites that they've got. It happens to be $28,000 US a night. It is gigantic. It, it, they think it's the most expensive, but fear not, you can get get a thousand dollar a night rooms if you decided you would like to stay there. Now Sharon here is posing in front of it. That right in there is a helipad and then over on here is a very prominent restaurant. That's only one of them. You go under the water they have another restaurant. Now this is intriguing because we talk about the different cultures though. Sharon right now is wearing a sleeveless shirt. We were going out for lunch and we were walking and afterwards things got a little silence. I'm just sort of astounded by with vision around there. She turned to me and said, this guy was just rubbing my arm. To them, that would be considered a risque type of clothing, which was prominent of a, of a, of a Muslim society. That and she was blonde would have probably been sort of a similar thing, but I was completely beyond it because there was a last thing I was expecting. Many of you that have seen pictures of this one have seen this. It's called the Palm Jumeirah. It is considered the world's largest man-made island. It is connected here well, to build that island, they had to get 7 million tons of rocks and sand just to make the foundation. Now, to give you an example, that many rocks and sand could build a two meter wide wall around the globe three times. It is connected to the mainland. It has a monorail system so that everybody can go back and cross this place. 
you just can't drive into it. It's it's looked after very closely because it's quite expensive. But about 20,000 people a day commute into the city and back that are living on these, these fronds that have to be part of the palm trees. They built this breakwater around the outside so when the, the ocean gets a little rough, the ocean gets, gets storms that comes in, that breakwater. Now I was looking at it and well, how in the world do they get in contact? Because there are, unless you have a boat, there's no, there's nothing, no way that that is touching the main part of the island. And then I've discovered that there is 25 meters below the sea level, they've got a huge sea tunnel that connects all of those particular things. Cost 12 billion American dollars to build this. And that was seven years ago. And it lets everybody has oceanfront property. That was the whole purpose of it along those sheds and good news, I have just found out there are some of those properties for sale. So if you've got just a little $9 million lying around, you can buy yourself one of these little properties and live on the Palm Chimera. After we were complete, now this is the beginning of it. I'm just astounded by what I've seen. And we got on a taxi it would take us to one of the main souks. Souks is Arabic for market. That's all it really is. And to me, it, it, like this was way nicer than the ones I remember seeing, seeing in Morocco. Morocco is just a zoo, complete circus. You got to watch out, you can get lost so easy. This very orderly, it almost resembles a mall that we have back in here. But you can basically find almost anything that you want to find there. This one will give you an example. Over here, it's got spices that can be done. Over here, if you want to buy some of the Arab garbs that they have, you can get some of these. Back here are the typical I love Dubai shirts for tourists. And it's almost more of a tourist attraction now. But there are special markets. This is one of the spice markets. You can find fresh produce markets. And we were talking earlier, you can't go hardly within a stone throw without finding these gold markets all over the place. And it is pretty, pretty impressive. Now, if you go, I have to recommend what's called the Sheikh Mohammed Center. It was lunchtime and we went to this place for lunch. So he was the one, but he helped to introduce us to Arab culture, to the clothing, and a legitimate Arab dinner. Now, this is a typical setting. You sit on cushions, and everybody's in bare feet. Nobody wears shoes in there. And he was, uh, he started it off, we started like everything. We started it off with a glass of Muslim wine. Now, wine is alcohol, and that's illegal. There is no wine. So they called their tea Muslim wine. And almost everything starts with a nice warm cup of tea. And we're able to sit back and just sort of relax. Then he brought forth a couple of members of his family and they talked about the clothing that they wear. And he, he did say <coughs> the main reason they dress that way is for protection because of the intense heat of the sun. They don't have to wear all black. <coughs> says, you can, but he said, his daughter, she's a typical teenager. She said, I'm tired of black. Can't I have one of those made in another color, like a red? He says, fine, you can have it red. She, she went, she was the big hit, biggest hit of, of the thing. Every little kid's got it. She got home and she looked at it and says, what am I going to wear tomorrow? Because if I wear this, everybody will know I already wore that one. So she went back to wearing black so they couldn't tell how much, what, how many, when, how often she wore that clothes. Remember this little lady here? She's one of our group. Pretty soon she was invited up and they helped the dress. Now notice he has tried on other clothing that is not all in black. They've got some of all sorts of colors and she got to dress up in their gear and got a chance to see it found the intriguing thing, that little cord that they use to hold their head pieces down, that goes way back in tradition and that was used to tether the camels when they were out in the, just out in the desert and they were traveling, they would use that little headpiece 
to tether their feet so they wouldn't take off on them. And it had been used so much that it's just become a part of Arab gear. But it was pretty intriguing that we'd had it. We sat down and he showed us, actually the wear the men wore were things they call penderas or dish dashes. The women wore jalabas. Both genders always covered their heads constantly. Uh, this one, he was showing us how they eat. They do not use utensils and they always use their right hands. One of our guys, we all heard the stories about why you can't use your left hands because it's used for all, all sorts of disgusting things. We, somebody said, why just that? And he said, well, it's tradition. So well, that's his answer. Now, if you look back, even in the Christian society, left-handed people in what the Christians were, were thought to practice witchcraft. If you go back to the days, days when witches were burned and all sorts of things like that. So, so that's not, even in our Bibles, it mentions the devil being left-handed. And I think that was just a case of, we have so many right-handed people that we, we put that stigma on them. But he showed how they ate and they, he was able to handle some pretty gooey stuff. And they would just use the bread to help bring that one up. Then it was our turn. They let us loose to go up there and sit down and try have their food. And it, it was a, an extremely good, as you can see, I'm here having a look at what these things are. I'm not quite sure about the spices yet. I found that I enjoy the spices. I think they really enhance most of the meals now, but I had a chance to sit down and sample all sort of these Arabic foods. And here you got a chance. I looked like a pretty happy camper because it was, my stomach was being filled and it was enjoyable. But if you can look in that, in my left hand, I'm holding utensils. They let us use our normal utensils like, like forks and spoons in order to be able to eat. But all in all, if you go there and you want to get a little insight, it's well worth taking and having lunch at this place and sitting down and having a lot of it explained to us. Then we got on a bus and we headed to a little town just outside. It's called Sarja. Sarja was the first place to have a school, the first place in the United Arab <coughs> and in the UAE that, that uh, had a school and its library. Uh, the Emirate, United Arab Emirates, was the very first place to promote women's rights. They actually led in the education of women since 1942. The name Sarja means rising sun because it's supposed to be enlightenment and people come from all over the place to go to school there. There's an English one that's designed that many people can go. The schooling is free to the Emirates. The Emirates don't have to pay for virtually anything. But if you're not from there, you have to pay. And this little town is considered the, the capital of Islamic culture because they've got the money to promote it, but it was really, and it's very, very peaceful. Then we got in the bus and we headed back and we're going to get a chance to see the Burj Khalifa. The Burj Khalifa is currently the tallest building in the world. It has 163 floors. The one in Shanghai is the second tallest one. There's one being built in Malaysia, I think, that's supposed to be taller, but it won't be for long because they've already laid the groundworks here to build another one that's going to be taller than the Burj Khalifa and the one there. This one is actually designed that they can add some to it. it to give you an example of the height, it is twice as high as the Empire State Building. And the Empire State Building for years was the tallest one in New York. It is designed after a desert flower that's called the spider lily. Now, you at this place, you can actually watch two sunsets. It's that tall. You can go down here. There's a little air observing deck that you can look out into the Arabian Gulf and watch the sun go down. Then you hustle into the building and you go over to their elevator. Their elevator is the fastest elevator in the world. It goes 64 kilometers an hour. I've been on it, you can't tell. It's not, an, 
and some of you have been on it, you do not realize it's going that fast. There are some lights that flash. I can't remember if they're playing music in the background or not. But the next thing you know, you're up there, you get out and you go out onto the observation deck and you can watch the sun go down the second time. It is at, for people, some of the Muslimic people who live above the <clears throat> above the 80th floor, they, they are in kind of a dilemma because on Ramadan, in the Muslim society, one-tenth, one of the pillars, one-tenth of your money goes to help feed the poor. So you don't have that. <clears throat> on Ramadan, you have to fast from sun, sunrise to sunset. And that's to give everybody the idea to what it feels like to be poor, to not be able to have food. Now here above the 80th floor, they actually have to shift their time because they have more, that the sun does not rise and set the same time as it does on the main part of it. Now you walk into it, when you go into this magnificent building, the first thing that you see is the second biggest aquarium in the world. <clears throat> this aquarium, is pretty impressive. Now, we all think Sharon here is posing for the camera, but that's not really true. She's looking across the place to the biggest candy store in the world that happens to be in there. Now, I have a sweet tooth, so I would not go in there. But I can't even imagine the amount of candy that had gone. But I did know that I had reached the ultimate when in one end of the Burj Khalifa, they have Tim Hortons. We had a little couple with us that was from someplace in the South. Their son was working in Canada and it introduced them to Timbits. He worshiped Timbits of all things, which to me are just the holes of the donuts. He came up, he saw this place first, he came up grinning from ear to ear with this box of Timbits in his hand. And it made his whole holiday to be able to buy Timbits in Dubai of all places. After that, it was time for supper. Now, first picture I showed you, there's this gigantic lake in front of this Burj Khalifa back here. There's a gigantic lake in front of it. It has the largest choreographed fountain in the world. It was designed by the same people who built the Bellagio in Las Vegas. And it is impressive too. And to have this in front of us as we ate, this is where we came in. You can see to the right over here is the lake where this is playing. We got to sit down in these areas and we got to watch this. And now you have to imagine this. Nighttime, you're having a great meal beside and just right beside this huge lake in front of the Burj Khalifa, watching a fountain dance to Nisan Dorma under an Arabian sky. Any thoughts that I had about this trip being a long one disappeared at that moment. It was just one of those magic nights that I will always remember as long as I live. And this is how we ate. Full stomach, good night's sleep, because we're played out. Next morning we started, I think this is our national sport. It's called dune smashing. They take you and it just floors me that outside of Dubai, it is just like that. It is sand and sand and more sand. <laughs> they came up to us in these four by fours. First thing they had to do is to take the air pressure out of the tires. They had to get it down to 18 pounds per square inch. So they have the ability to maneuver these things in the sand. And then we were off, up and down and over. I had a blast. I thought it was really, really fun. Every once in a while, Somebody would get bogged down, but these guys are so good at doing these things. They would pitch together, and before they knew it, they'd have them dug out, and they'd be going again, and then we were going down these amazing, amazing hills. Now, like I said, I thought this was great, but then again, I'm used to trying to navigate 
the potholes in Moose Jaw here during the spring. So this wasn't that trying. Many of our travelers did not enjoy the ride as much as they could have. In fact, several of them got quite nauseous. Here they're digging it out. Once it's done, they refill the tires so they go back on that and they use a special air pump that works out of the out of the spark plugs that are in there. We would think that here's Sharon. She, that's a fake smile. She's posing with, with her, her driver that happened to be in there. And if we look real closely, she's carrying that little plastic bag for a reason. <laughs> she did not enjoy this near as well as I did on that trip. This was the group we had. These are all Canadians, and I thought this is pretty cool, the way they're standing. The two on the end are from Newfoundland. These two are from New Brunswick. I'm from, the three of us back there are from Saskatchewan. These two girls are from BC, but they're Saskatchewan wannabes. And this one is from British Columbia. But that gay, those are the, the members of our group that were from Saskatchewan. The thing to look at it though is there's nothing behind, just all that sand that's back there. Now we have, as far as I'm concerned, as beautiful sunsets as you're going to find in the world. But everybody's got a beautiful sunset. This was a sunset that we found in the desert. All of us climbed into our little climbed into our four by fours and they took us this little oasis for supper and we got a chance to sit outside have a really good meal this is what the place looked like as we entered it you could have all some people had special fake paint flowers painted on their hands some took camel rides while they're in there uh, but the meal i can't say enough about the meal it was terrific After we had our dinner, it was time to leave. And I'll be honest with you, I'd had enough. I wanted to see what, um, what an Arab world was like. Dubai was not like the Arab world. Dubai is a world entirely on its own. <clears throat> we were going to head to Oman. So we boarded our little bus and it took us to the border crossing in El Ain. Now in El Ain, it's a little bit of a different different kind of a place. LA means garden city. If you have water, you have plants. If you don't have water, you don't have much for plants. We had to go through the border. We all had to go in and we had to buy a visa for about $25 you net. It's just a cash grab, but it's their country. I don't blame them for trying to use tourists to help pay some of those bills. They just weren't quite prepared for a full bus. So it took way longer than you would have liked to have had it. But gave us a chance to stretch our legs. Before we get on the bus though, the women were all allowed to go on the bus. The men had to get their suitcases and they had to be checked along the, on the line to go there. But we checked in that, got on the bus, and then we're going to continue. This was what it's like as you start going towards the water. This is now Oman. This is the road you go desolate. And then as you get towards water, you start to find things getting greener. And when you get to the ocean front, it is there. Now, I did like the company we were traveling with because they never kept you longer than two hours maximum before they found some reason for you to stop. We stopped at a camel market. Got a chance to get out. Now we're all prairie people. We haven't seen that many camels. So we were... It was quite pleasant that we were getting a chance, stretch our legs, and to see that one. Camel racing is huge over there. The thing about it, though, is that they used to use kids to race, and it was dangerous, and kids are getting hurt. Now they use robots to sit on the camels when they do their racing to help protect them. It was kind of fun, though, just wandering around, seeing where all the camels are set up. We had the little one get a chance to see a little one, and we we're all ready to go. To finish it and it looks here Sharon has found herself a new friend but she couldn't take it home with him and so we're ready to get on the bus and head towards Muscat. Now again about in here we stopped at another little place for lunch. 
we went into this little place, typical Arab setting. You can see they do have a little coach here. Most of the time, we're just sitting along on the floor, all of us with our shoes off, sitting down, just relaxing, waiting for our little glass of tea, of, of wine, or of, of, of our Arab wine, a glass of tea. And they had a box full of lunch for us to go. This was the entrance into that place where we were. Here I'm having my glass, we're waiting for our little glass of Arab tea and uh, waiting for our little lunch to choose. This was the young family that hosted us there. Uh, they were just incredible. This, this little girl just stole everybody's hearts right off the bat as soon as we found them. And, and it's to just living out there. And it was nice. I felt great that that by our staying there, we were able to help fulfill lots of theirs. By the time we landed though, we landed, we were in the, this, we went right directly to this souk. It was a mutra souk, and it was the old, one of the oldest souks in the Arab world. Now, I, you could tell immediately, it wasn't like Dubai where things were pristine. This one looked like a lot more like, I had expected this to still way more organization than we ever saw back in Morocco, but but you could find everything. There was anything you could dream of, you could find in this particular place. We, this guy called us over and he wanted to sell me one of these sticks. Uh, he sort of explained it to me. These sticks were sticks specially made to help keep your significant other in line. So I figured, oh, I don't know how well that's going to go over, but but that was just, but like I said, you could buy everything, anything. After we got a chance to check this out, it was time for a supper or dinner, and uh, we we're right down on the waterfront. So we walked out, and it was just a beautiful sight seeing all of these things. We walked into this one, and a few of us noticed this little room to the right which is basically right on the floor among cushions. So we all went down there. The rest of the group ended up going up to a more traditional style restaurant. And in this place, it was, it was fabulous. I mean, they did, the, they brought in food, they would serve it to us. I end right there, we sat down. And then Mohammed, our tour guide, figures about time he wanted to make me a legitimate Arab. So he wrapped this hood around my head to help become an Amir. And of course, I keep thinking I look more like Jack Nicholson there than I do uh, do an Arab, an Arab Amir on it. But uh, of course, no, a decent Amir does not have his harem. So so the girls came and posed on the side just to be able to help me go with that. But all in all, it was a very memorable night. Again, it was incredible food. And and we got to eat sort of Arab style, but they did allow us to have cutlery. Thank goodness. Next morning we woke up. They took us to what was called the Grand Mosque. The Grand Mosque is really is the Grand Mosque. I mean, it allows, it's the only mosque to allow non-Muslim visitors. Very strict dress codes. Both men and women had to wear long pants. You had to cover your shoulders. Women had to cover their hair. Now, I'm used to when I walk into a religious place, taking my hat off. That's not the case. I was wearing a baseball cap and they said, no, you go right ahead. That's fine. It just didn't seem right. Of course, they have a place there for you keep your shoes and you have to go. This one blew me away. I didn't realize until I saw this pictures, but these ladies, these are our people. Every one of them bought scarves that would go along with their outfits. Now, I'm the kind of guy that I'm lucky if both my socks match in the morning. I never thought that they'd be going with, that they would even think of synchronizing their wear with the regular wear. And uh, that's how they had to go. And we walked into the Grand Mosque. The Grand Mosque holds 20,000 worshipers at a time. The women's side of it owns, holds 750 women at a time. The footage in here is just under the size of an American football field, which is gigantic. 
In here, you can see this Persian rug. It is the second largest woven Persian rug, rug in the world. It's 70 meters by 60 meters. It took 600 women four years to complete it. I'm not sure if the women, the women have to be on this side of it. The men are on this side of it where, where a lot of the cases that they're working with, but it is immaculate. Chandeliers constantly. And I'm very happy with having the opportunity to get a chance to see it. We left outside. And here we are just waiting in the gardens, ready to go home. Now there's one more thing that we were prepared to do, but I don't know whether it was the diet we'd been on or the weather that we're in, the culture differences, or maybe it was still after effects from that dune crashing that we, or smashing that we went for. But they had set for us a one more trip out to the Bahia Fort and the Jabrin Castle. Most of our group just wanted to go back to the hotels. Few of us said, no, you paid your money. I paid my dollar. I'm going to see what I'm going to see on this one. So here we've got a full bus, and there are only eight of us to go out here, and it was well worth the trip. The, the Bahia Fort was a, well, we'd seen other forts all the way along the line. When the, but the Jabrin Castle was on the outskirts. It was a fort that was built to cover the caravan routes. Uh, the actual emir actually does come and live there every so often, but it was absolutely empty. We were the only people there, and it was it was really was very impressive. Here, Mohammed is helping to explain some of the intricate parts of the castle. And as you can see that uh, there isn't anybody in sight inside the narrow areas that we walk through the passageways. This one, I, I really like this picture with Mohammed standing there showing what's in the background and on one corner of it. Then we went into the library. This was the library where they would go and sit down. Not a whole lot of books. Most of them are religious books. And then he showed how they would read. And we said, I don't know if I could be reading sitting like that for very long. He said, you get used to it. It's the same as they, they can sit on their haunches for hours because they do that. And so you had the chance to, uh, to show us a little bit about what it was like to sit down and read. We all went outside of the castle to have our, just the six of us to have our pictures taking, taken. These four people were members of the tour group that was hosting us. And then the four of us were the only two were still people that were still going when we got going. And it is kind of interesting. It's quite a, quite a cross over of the groups. These two ladies are from Colorado. I, of course, am from Saskatchewan. And Bernie here, I think, was from Mars. I'm not quite sure where, but... That would have been a pretty good guess. That just simply means so long for now. And uh, that was a picture of our group out there on the desert. Fairly large. And that tells the place. Well, that was the presentation. And uh, if, I have, if any of you have any questions you want to ask about, I will try to answer them. But, uh, but uh, it was a very, very good trip. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and it's true. Like, we were able to get wine and beer in Morocco, which is Muslim. There was no alcohol, none, none whatsoever, in the Emirates. How many people were in that group? I think we had about 26 or 27. It's kind of nice with the groups because you have a lot of free time that you don't have to be doing everything with everybody. And so you have free time. Like I said, that time that Sharon had that guy rub her arm, we were off on our own to have lunch someplace. And, and you have, pl there's plenty of time that you have it was a this was a sort of a convention that 
they asked most of us help to run trips with people. And to do that, the go ahead people sort of invite us to go with them every once in a while to a place that we might consider taking people. I don't know. I don't know if the people I've got would be adventurous enough to go over there. Uh, you have to be special travelers like yourselves to be able to, to, to be able to go over there and, and know how to adapt and not feel, not feel self-conscious. I don't need the music, but uh, it, it was, it was, a, like I said, it was a very interesting one. I really am happy that I had a chance to that I had a chance to go over there and see it. And I eventually I'll be going again, but who knows how long that is. There's, there's a lot of pretty interesting places in the world. 